it's with great um, honour and pleasure to be here uh, this afternoon to talk about my work in relation to the canary uh, analogy. Of course, many canaries died in the coal mine, so um, <laughs> hopefully that will not be uh, my fate. Um, I remember when I became Irish officer in 2003, and I was talking to my husband, and I was sort of musing about what I'd like to, to achieve. And, as ever, he brought me down to earth and he said, you know, Emily, if you could actually explain to the people what an ombudsman actually does, you would have performed a great service to him. So when I became European ombudsman, I realized my task was even, was even greater uh, because it is, a, it is a small institution compared with obviously the Commission, the Council and, and others, uh, just 70 people. Um, and it's quite a young institution as well. Uh, it uh, emerged out of the Maastricht Treaty and the first uh, ombudsman, Jakob Zoltman, was appointed in um, uh, 1990, 1996. Uh, he had been the Greek, oh, sorry, the Finnish ombudsman, and then his uh, successor was Nikki Forrest the Almondoris, who was the uh, had been the Greek ombudsman, and then I was elected by the Parliament in uh, 2013, in July 2013, and I began uh, work in um, October uh, 2013. Uh, so an ombudsman goes in and out with the Parliament. So when the new Parliament came in in 2014, I had to go for election again. Uh, but it was one of those things where if Carlsberg don't do elections, but if they did, that would have been a wonderful election because uh, I was the only candidate. Um, <laughs> but even so, there were 50 people who voted against my appointment. You know? and, uh, even though there's a big figure up there, it's like a bad review, you say, who are you? So anyway, I'm going to try and, and uh, talk to you about, uh, about the institution itself and, and uh, what I'm in particular trying to uh, do with it. And, I was just saying to some of the colleagues uh, over lunch that it's it's kind of a difficult time to be a European ombudsman because um, by definition you're you're being you're critiquing the, the administration and by definition lots of people are critiquing and criticising the European administration at the moment it's a difficult time uh, politically but I think as an ombudsman you have to sort of put that to one side and just to do your work um, as as you are intended uh, and the treaties and, and the statute uh, lays down. So, um, let me see if this works. Yes, so essentially this, this was the thinking, like any ombudsman, you, you are that sort of independent, neutral link between uh, the citizens and the EU administration. And I remember, I think possibly one of the best definitions is that you sort of lend your, your status, your expertise and your weight um, as an ombudsman to the individual and pit it against the big institution so that you sort of even up uh, the, the, the playing field uh, between them and that, that there is more an equal jousting, if you like, when, uh, when a complaint is, is taken against, uh, against uh, an institution. So we can take complaints from uh, anybody, anybody who has any, uh, anything to do with any of the institutions, um, uh, citizens, companies, NGOs, business associations and so on. Um, and what's, what's unique, I suppose, not unique, but it's certainly different in, in the Irish system and in other systems of the Ombudsman. You don't have to be directly or <coughs> personally affected by something in order to, to bring a complaint. So that, <coughs> therefore, we get a lot of complaints uh, from NGOs, many of whom are based in Brussels and who are watching governance issues, watching transparency issues, watching human rights, and so on. And some of the very, the very good complaints that, that we get, which do enable us to do a very serious and significant piece of work often come from the NGOs, and that would not be the case in other countries where you have to be personally affected by something, directly affected by something, in order to, to bring a complaint. So most cases are about the lack of transparency in the EU uh, administration, well, about 20% of the world are in relation to um, the transparency is the biggest number of cases. That was a letter that was written by British American Tobacco, I think, to the Commission. Uh, and that was one that was um, sent out by the Commission uh, after the transparency of the network request had been made. And uh, they may have been absolutely correct legally in terms of what they, uh, what they, what they left out, what they omitted. But two issues, one was about tobacco, people are very, very alive and sensitive to tobacco lobbying and in Brussels uh, generally. Um, and also the look was appalling. Uh, was I'm not sure whether they could have presented it in a different way, but it was, it was it sort of very starkly highlighted uh, the claim that uh, the EU administration is not very uh, transparent. <coughs> so, refusing to give access to EU documents, EU decision making, lobbying transparency, uh, the bargain doors, all of those uh, are issues around 
transparency. And one of the things that the, the EU institutions lack is an information commissioner. We are familiar with that uh, institution here. And that when appeals are made to the information commissioner, the information commissioner makes binding decisions in relation to it. So, the, you know, whether it's a government department or local authority, whatever, the, um, the institution has to, uh, in Ireland and indeed other countries, either accept and release or else take, uh, you know, challenge it in court. Whereas in, um, in in the EU, it's it's, it's different. I can, I can only make recommendations in relation to, to the release of documents. And that if the documents are not released, then the individual or the MEP or the company or whoever is seeking access has then to, to go to court. And that's, that's, that's a high bar. And sometimes these cases can take very long. I have at uh, times publicly in, in Brussels that perhaps there should be such a, such a uh, commissioner, such an office, so that it does, so that the uh, the institutions are in, um, are in complete control of the access tap, if you like. Lobbying transparency, a uh, huge piece. The, the volume of lobbying, as many of you will know in Brussels, is huge because the EU has become essentially a global regulator because of all the things it regulates in, in Europe, and we can see that at the moment with the Google case and uh, <coughs> you know, data protection, um, uh, IT, chemicals, pharmaceuticals, you know, financial services, all of that. So Brussels is absolutely full to the brim of very, very busy and active uh, lobbies. Um, as you know, um, what are very attractive to these lobbying companies, these corporations, are people who have actually worked in the institutions. So that's the whole revolving doors piece when people who have worked often very actively at a high level in the commission on a particular file, move across the world to uh, work with uh, uh, work with a corporation who have a great interest in what was in those particular files. And the issue for me is how, not what the individuals do, because they of course have a right to go to the private sector if they so wish, but it's what the commission does or what the institutions do in making sure that the conflicts of interest are, are um, mitigated, if that's possible. Um, okay. So other examples of individual complaints, lots of, say, small companies who would be very dependent perhaps on a, on a, on a contract from the commissioner or another institution, they run into trouble in relation to late payments or non-payment or a dispute over certain matters uh, in connection with that, they can come to us, we can look at the entire file and then we can make a recommendation. And 90% uh, of the recommendations now would, would, be, would be accepted, which is, which is a reasonably good batting average. Another thing, language policy for EU websites and public consultations, that tends to be a very big issue. Increasingly, as you know, when this has become um, the language, uh, it's overtaken French in terms of the, the, the dominant language of the administration. And then very often, um, agencies and institutions just think they just need to translate uh, their particular um, records and documents into English, French, and German, or maybe one other language. So it's a constant battle to have them see that actually uh, they are not being very inclusive of important documents, um, so whether it's public consultations or tenders for contract or whatever, are not available in, in, in all of the languages. Then you hear that it's the cost of interpreting, the cost of translation, and so on, but you know, uh, we hardly need to do that after all. Uh, how EU money is spent, um, that would be uh, in relation to, for example, the cohesion funds, how the Commission checks that the money is being spent. Uh, appropriately, uh, and that it is, for example, human rights proved um, when it is being used within, within a member state. Um, yeah, inquiries conducted. Uh, now we get about, we say, we get about twenty thousand complaints every year. A lot of them we send right back to the member states. We try and help everybody who comes with us. So a lot of the complaints when I was a Irish officer, I would get complaints from my European officer. But we always try and help everybody who comes to us. We will direct them to where their complaint can be um, uh, can be best dealt with. So we open a, a roughly around 300 in investigations once we see that the, uh, that the complaint is within within our, our remit and um, and so on. Most of them would be against the European Commission. Not that it's any better or worse than any other uh, institution. In fact, there's very high standards of administration in many of the areas. But it's just it's the big beast in the jungle, so you would expect that to happen. Um, EU agencies, EPSO, uh, the European Personnel Selection Office, obviously they're the gatekeeper when it comes to uh, uh, accessing employment uh, in the EU. So any of you who might have children who have applied for, for positions probably would have gone through 
episodes. So we would get complaints very often from candidates who had failed a particular exam, failed to get a job, and we would just simply look at the process and, and to make um, uh, make recommendations for, for improvement. Uh, the European External Action Service, sometimes we get complaints in relation to things that have happened in delegations, for example, or uh, transparency complaints. At uh, the European Parliament, we don't deal with the political piece, we just deal with the administration and so on. Uh, oh, well, the <coughs> European is, is, um, is another one that we might get a lot of transparency uh, issues around. So, um, you can see there are 300 is a huge number, given that there are 500 million uh, people in the, in the EU. So when I came in, and indeed during my election campaign, I had to think about, well, how am I going to bring this office into the next stage in terms of its development and its visibility and its, its usefulness to the institutions and to the citizens? And I was kind of, I was very familiar with the office because as a member state officer, uh, I've been part of the network, so I knew the good things it did, I knew the things that I, I, I um, thought it didn't do so well. And I suppose everybody who takes up an office brings their own particular sensibility to it. Uh, my um, um, immediate uh, predecessor, Nicky Forrest, the Amandoris, he uh, was a, um, a political science professor, and so when he came into office, it was just when we'd had the new countries, they all the new accession states, and he had specialised in Eastern and Central European. So he, his, his focus was very much on that, more of the external piece, if you like, and, and, and um, helping new officers' offices and, and, and all of that. And because of my background as, as a journalist um, and, and so on, I, I was more interested, I suppose, in... Um, in the internal piece, but also in, in looking for cases that were current, that had current relevance and that had a significant public interest piece. Uh, and that my idea was that I would either use my power of own initiative, which means that I don't actually have to have a complaint <coughs> to, to open an inquiry, but also the complaints that we did get to try and attract complaints. And once you mind them, M-I-N-E-D, I mean, that you could, you could achieve something quite significant. So, um, that's the route I decided to uh, follow. So uh, my criteria that, that they are in the public interest, um, and but also that they're capable of a good outcome. Uh, I mean, you know, you, I could do something incredibly worthy, and everybody would say that well, it's a great issue to get involved in. But I, if I have zero chance of getting it across the line, then it's not worth it. And I don't mean that I go for no hanging proof, but you know, you have to have. In a small office with very limited resources, you have to really optimise those resources and make sure that, that you're going to have a good chance of getting um, a good a good outcome. Um, so cooperation with the European Network of Ombudsmen. What I decided to do instead of endlessly going around to each other's conferences, um, I set up uh, what I call parallel investigations with the with the network. So. I would do the European piece, the piece that involved in the EU uh, agency, and they would do their piece within their own uh, member states. So one of the, for the for very first one I did related to the EU border agency, uh, Frontex. So I looked at how it was um, dealing with the returns operations. These were the, op the operations that it um, administers uh, in conjunction with member state uh, authorities when the member states are seeking to return people who have failed the asylum test and were being returned to a third country, perhaps Nigeria or, or, or other countries like that. So I did my piece in relation to how Frontex uh, deals with that to make sure that the, um, those flights are uh, and the whole population are um, aligned with, their, with, uh, with the appropriate human rights standards. And then uh, about 17, maybe around the 15 to 17 of the member state colleagues did their piece. And you know, so together we were, we were getting a, a lot greater uh, traction in that. So this was um, one of the big talking points when I came in was the Transatlantic Trade Investment Partnership. And when, at the time I came in, certainly in 2014, there was a lot of Parliamentary, um, EU parliamentary, and obviously member state parliaments as well, have a lot of civil society agitation around the lack of transparency of these negotiations. And so I decided the first big own initiative investigation was into the transparency of, um, of this particular uh, process. So um, apart from just you know, questioning the, the, the Commission and, and the relevant uh, Commissioner and DG in, in, uh, in relation to what they were doing, what was visible and what wasn't uh, visible. 
we also did a public consultation. When I asked people to define their terms, I didn't want if they say they're not transparent enough, okay, well, what does that mean? What is isn't transparent? What do you want? What do you think should be more transparent? And, and could possible harms emerge if everything is too transparent? I thought that's ever going to happen. But um, so that was, uh, that was it. But I suppose I was helped that the guy in the picture on the right, he's the one of the um, US uh, negotiators, some of you may have met him, Paul Rani, I think his name is an Irish name. Yeah, so, um, the, so I was actually enabled in this because the new commission that came in, the younger commission, had transparency as a big piece of their work and they wanted to be judged by it their transparency standards. So that was very nice for me because I could always say to them, well, you're delighted with what I'm doing and what I'm recommending because it absolutely fits your agenda. So a lot of the recommendations that I made that might not have gone across the line, you know, in a different commission or a few years ago, are getting across the line. Uh, and it was Commissioner Malmstrom, who is the, the Trade Commissioner, and um, you know her whole piece is, is around transparency of that as as an MEP. I think she was involved in the Transparency Regulation 1049 and so on. So um, that that was quite a successful um, investigation. It wasn't just my doing it, but as a result of, I suppose, united efforts or different efforts coming together. A lot of the documents uh, in relation to TTIP are, are now, a lot of documents uh, in relation to TTIP are now, um, are now online. Um, so the the difficulty, the tricky one was around the US because the EU at the beginning of these negotiations have essentially given a veto to the US and said that if you don't want these documents released, well, we won't release them. But I've made a point to the Commission um, to the Commission that um, if it is an EU document, then it is amenable to the transparency regulation to ten forty nine that it has to be examined in that light. And yes, of course you can consult with the US. But uh, and there may be very valid reasons which you may accept by the US doesn't want these documents to be released. But if they are released, then you have to uh, you have to uh, release them. So uh, transparency in the ECB. Yeah, now this was uh, kind of in between a complaint and an anonymity. What happened? Some of you may have followed the story last year when a member of the uh, executive board of the ECB, the French guy, his name escapes me at the moment, um, he was at a private dinner uh, in the University of London, I think, uh, maybe wrong with that, I'm not sure, but it was a particular school within this college that had been uh, sponsored by a hedge fund uh, corporations. So it was a private dinner, chatting about rules, and he gave a speech, and he let slip a particular piece of information which um, would not be formally released by the ECB until the following morning. Apparently, the two speech the speeches were supposed to be released at the same time when he was speaking on it. And so there was a tiny little market movement in relation uh, to this. So there was a bit of an outcry about this. So I, I wrote to uh, Mario Draghi, and I suggested to him that um, this was a good administration, and, um, that given the importance of the ECB, that there should be no perception that certain people are being given privileged access uh, and, and that whatever comes out should be uh, available to all. So as a result of that, they um, did uh, change their uh, processes and they've also, also changed their rules of engagement in, in that um, they now are observing a period, a seven day period of silence before some of their monthly meetings or monthly uh, announcements and that's what, what other people comparable global institutions do. So a small intervention like that was able to yield um, a, a result. Yes, that's it. News of speaking engagement, publication calendars of governing board members, extension of high periods a week, running up to monetary policy meetings. So again it's it's all around transparency. Um, and that and I think also I think what, what enabled you know me to, to get certain things across the line on that is that as, as we all know, there's, there's a much, the ECB might have been a very obscure uh, institution a few years ago, but most citizens would be aware of it now, and certainly uh, people who were in, welcomed the Troika um, across their borders would be very aware of it. So the public consciousness of these institutions, these financial institutions, are much, much stronger than it would have been a few years ago. And I've said to 
you see the, you know, the, the ERB as well, that they, they, they have a, a duty to respond to it, but it also makes good business sense because they are going to be, over the years, increasingly hit with transparency requests, so they have to get their act together or else they're going to spend their life explaining to press conferences why documents have been blacked out or why they're not making them available uh, and so on. So, you know, it's a new era uh, and new expectations. I mean, I, I noticed that myself uh, as information commissioner here uh, during the boom times. Um, you know, hardly an FOI request crossed the Department of the Taoiseach's desk, or very few in the Department of Finance even, uh, because everything was going fine and nobody was was, uh, was rooting around too much. And then once the, the, the collapse happened, there was a huge 200, 300 percent increase in, in that. So you know, the, uh, equally, these EU bodies have to be aware that, uh, that um, transparency demands change over time. Yeah, now this was one that um, I haven't got across the line yet in that the Commission has turned a recommendation down, but I don't think that the play is completely over yet. So some of you will have been aware of the big tobacco directive that uh, went through, um, I think 2013 or 2014, I think it finally went through. And it was called the most heavily lobbied dossier in the life of the EU, uh, because the tobacco industry just went <coughs> all set. Uh, and it's quite extraordinary um, what, what went on there. This is a complaint that came uh, to me from one of the more active NGOs in terms of transparency. It's called CEO or Corporate Europe Observatory. And they alleged that the Commission had um, not disclosed certain meetings that they'd had with the tobacco industry. And if that was the case, it would have not been confined with the, um, with the tobacco, the, uh, with the UN um, uh, Tobacco Convention, which basically tries to restrict the space in which um, the tobacco companies can operate at government or administrative uh, level. So uh, they sent the complaint to us, and we looked at the files, and we discovered that it wasn't that the um, that the meetings had been hidden as such, but it was that you had to go looking to see whether they had happened, if that was the case. So in other words, you had to make a transparency a request, you had to make an FOI request, so they were not being the details of these meetings were not being uh, released um, proactively. So I took the view that this was maladministration because it breached, if not absolutely the legal letter of the law in relation to the UN Framework Convention on Tobacco, but it certainly breached the spirit of it because even within the, the convention, the idea is that you, you are proactive about this, you're not passive, you know, you're proactive in other ways in which you can, you can do this. So I made um, recommendations to the, uh, yeah, yeah, okay, so the, these are the obligations. Uh, that commission should proactively publish all meetings with tobacco lobbyists and heads of meetings, and that lawyers representing the tobacco industry are also lobbyists, because my colleagues who looked at the files discovered that um, the commission officials weren't noting down certain meetings because they did not recognize that lawyers were lobbyists. Mm -hmm. And in fact, they can act, as we know, in both ways. They can act if there's a piece of litigation, entirely correct, that that should be kept uh, private. But if you look, you just if you can wait a moment, Google um, you know, lobbying firms in Brussels and then look at the law firms that come up and then look to see who their cast of characters are. Very often they are. Um, people who worked in the legal services at the council level and commission level, and they are seen as, as, as big catches, and, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But it's important that the commission uh, sees them in that role and not just in their, in their purely, purely uh, legal role. So the Commission decided not to follow the recommendations. Um, I spoke to Vice President Timmermans a few times in, in relation to this, and he took the view that, uh, that um, he took the view what? He took the view that, oh yes, the one um, uh, commissioner, the one DG uh, that does proactively put out its meetings is DG Health. And he says, well, DG Health, and it is not going to dictate the transparency policies for the rest of the DGs. No, I don't accept that. And I particularly don't accept it because, again, if you, if you look at the transparency register and you look at the tobacco lobbyists and you look at the files that they lobby, some of them don't even bother lobbying DG Health because they are the, the gatekeepers. It would be you know, DG Trade or DG Energy or DG anything because it's, a, it's an industry. It's not just about public health. So uh, to my mind, it's important. So that was... Um, that hasn't been accepted yet, but I, and, and then, 
there was a meeting subsequently, it would be kind of an anti-tobacco grouping in, in Parliament at the invitation of the MEPs, and I happened to sit beside the health commissioner, um, and uh, he hadn't been made aware of this particular case. Uh, so I'm going to be meeting with him, and he would be very proactive in relation to, to this. So I'm hoping that if I, I might have lost the battle, but I may not, uh, I may not lose the war application soon. Um, those were the joint return operations that I was talking about uh, earlier. Um, and then um, I had been pushing, well, my predecessor had pushed, and then eventually, uh, over time, I, I got it across the line when I made a report to the European Parliament that Frontex should have a complaints uh, mechanism um, so that people who feel that their rights have been uh, not safeguarded or abused or whatever not upheld. Um, by Frontex can make a complaint. They had resisted this for several years because they said that if there is a human rights abuse, it is the fault or the responsibility of the member state and not uh, Frontex. Uh, and uh, I took the view that this was uh, not the case because even if the border guards come from a member state, they're operating very often under the authority of Frontex and they have the Frontex badge or armband with the, the EU logo quite prominently displayed. So obviously people, <coughs> sometimes it, it may be a context guard as the first person they meet, so obviously they're, they're going to make the connection. Now, uh, obviously many of the complaints would not be uh, as a result of Frontex actions, but Frontex could act as a sort of a clearing mm -hmm. place for those complaints and, and, and direct them appropriately. So when I made a, a presentation, or when I made a report to the European Parliament, they overwhelmingly um, voted to support that recommendation. So, um, that is going to be uh, accepted. Yes, trilogues, trilogues. When I went over to Europe, possibly to my shame, I'd never heard, I didn't know what trilogues were, but every MEP I met were talking about trilogues. They were either running to a trilogue or they'd be up to the four o'clock in the morning, knowing, knowing laughter around me, up until four o'clock in the morning at a trilogue, or couldn't do this because there were whatever trilogues. So, is, as clearly you all know, um, the, the no, deal no. making between the, the Commission, the Council, and the, um, and, and, and the Parliament. And it has been very effective. Something like, I think, 85% of all legislative proposals get through at first reading instead of having to go through second or third conciliation of the Commission or Council. And, um, but there have been unease expressed to me, not formally, but informally, from NGOs, from parliamentarians themselves, from lots of actors in the European uh, stage have felt that um, this process wasn't transparent enough. And I read a few academic theses on trilogues um, to punish myself for not having known what they were a vision. And uh, what came up is that trilogues are seen as a, as a trade off between efficiency and uh, transparency. Uh, so the issue for that I wanted to look at was where this trade-off is, is appropriate at what point do you think it's okay now to go hugger mugger into a dark room and hammer this out but before that you have to be transparent about what you do. So when I, I started this and actually of, of all of the, the ones I started this probably generated the, the, the most reaction from the from the institutions initially and they initially um, uh, questioned whether I had a mandate uh, to do this because they saw it as a political piece uh, and I had no business uh, dealing with the uh, political uh, workings of the Parliament, the Council, and the Commission, which is absolutely true. Uh, but where I come in is, is the transparency piece, and under the, uh, the, the, the treaties, uh, EU lawmaking is supposed to be conducted as public and, and so on. Um, and I felt and they agreed that it was within my rights to look at that narrow piece of the process, which is the transparency piece. <coughs> so I talked about it as a mapping exercise. So I went about going about mapping it. So some of my colleagues went into the various institutions and looked at that. What is uh, publicly available, what you need to do a 1049 uh, freedom of information request in relation to, and what, um, what you will never see. Uh, so they did that, and then I put a series of questions to the three institutions in relation to, you know, th those sort of issues and that, and I got their responses. And then I um, uh, have a um, yes, a public consultation, open for another 
we give a hand and you feel care to join in. Um, and I looked at two closed files. I decided I wouldn't look at an ongoing um, um, directive or, or a piece of law because that just didn't seem appropriate. So it was better to actually look and see what happened in two closed files. I didn't choose them for any particular reason other than they had kind of a public interest uh, uh, vibe uh, about them. Uh, so then, at the end of that, I would make uh, suggestions as to how these could be made more transparent. But what was interesting, I remember talking at a parliament committee about this, and I was asked by an MEP from um, Denmark, uh, who would be very, very uh, uh, pro-transparency. And she had concerns that if you open it up any more than it is currently opened up, then you're going to allow the... Uh, the lobbies to get in and to get access and to and that the MEPs and others would come under even greater pressure. Uh, other people put forward the view that <coughs> lobbyists, because they are well resourced, a lot of them, uh, because the companies that employ them have a lot of on it, already have access that other uh, players don't, because either they're NGOs and they have tight budgets and they can't spread themselves across everything. Or, or for other reasons. So, but anyway, I, 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 we, we'll see what the, what the public consultation uh, uh, throws up. Yeah, so this is my latest one. It's not a no-way message, it's just a letter to that gentleman uh, who's had the Euro group, as you know. Um, and I have a Dutch assistant who keeps telling me how to pronounce his name in Dutch, but I'm not going to pain you with, with it. Um, so, again, you know, when a, lo a lot of people that might come to your office, um, because the, the Troika was still fresh in people's minds, a lot of people would, would come to me informally, maybe at meetings, or come up to me after a meeting and, and ask about how to make the Troika accountable, and who could I blame for the collapse of the public health service in my country, or who could I blame for this, and how do I make a complaint against the Troika? And of course, you can't, because it's not an EU institution, you know? Um, and obviously, with, with the Eurogroup, as Dan and others will know much, much more than I have become such a big player, politically, economically, every which way, um, there have been questions about its, uh, its transparency, its accountability, because um, it doesn't exist in the institutional sense, and it isn't accountable to any, it's not accountable to the European Parliament and whatever individual ministers, of course, are accountable to their, to their governments, but not as, a, as, a, as an institution. And I know Mr. Varoufakis made a big play of this, of course, he was his own transparency machine and, uh, <laughs> and, and let, let, let a lot of it. Uh, so I think uh, this gentleman, this um, uh, has. Uh, and also because the Dutch presidency, obviously, as well, uh, the Dutch presidency of the council has made transparency a big part of its piece. So he's obviously slipping the wind, and he, uh, some in early March, he announced um, some new transparency measures. I think uh, the agenda might be published now in advance, and um, yeah, there's a. There's a, yes, a detailed meeting agenda, it's your group summing up letter, uh, program, country related documents, um, and so on. So it is a start. Of course, what, what a lot of people want to know is about the individual contributions of individual member states uh, at these meetings, and that would be, be a very hard sell. So um, I wrote to them just last week to encourage this, um, this initiative. Uh, and um, raise a few issues because a lot of the preparatory work uh, that, that is done for, for the group is done by commission officials and council officials and a lot of those documents are actually council and commission documents and therefore they are uh, come under the, the 1049 regime. So I think this is the beginning, as they say, of a conversation um, with the Euro group. But I think increasingly and especially with, with what's happening politically and with people talking about two and three speed Europe and you know, the, the, the role of the Eurogroup and its importance and all of that. I think just like the ECB and the EIB, it can come under greater pressure to be um, a lot more.